Susan Miranda, and I am an oboist in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. I am going to help you out with one of your Minnesota band directors um, honor band etudes. This is the etude on page 70, number six, and they are asking for it at a quarter note equals 72. Now, I will tell you that I often listen to auditions and I would much rather you play an audition um, thoughtfully and musically rather than ridiculously fast uh, where I, you know, can't necessarily hear all of the notes um, equally, separately, and everything kind of rushes and mushes together because you just want it to be quick. Um, with that in mind, when you look at this piece, I am sure your eye is immediately going to go to all of those 16th notes. Well, I want you to know that they are not as fast as you probably think they should be. And another part, when you hear me playing this, you'll notice that in measure seven, the second beat, I actually kind of elongate that a little bit. There's a little line above the A flat and that is called a tenuto. And a tenuto is the exact opposite of a staccato, which you have quite a bit of in the other etude. So you're actually going to lengthen that note slightly. Don't overdo it, um, but it's uh, it can be just a little bit longer than everything else, uh, which is really beautiful musically, but it can also give you an opportunity to kind of ground yourself and figure out what comes next. Um, so oftentimes in etudes, you want to be very particular, very rhythmic. Um, in this little section, it gives you a little bit of leeway to be a bit more musical. So let me play a bit of that. I'm just gonna start on measure seven. Did you notice at the very end, there is a fermata? And I'm sure that in band, you have seen your band director just kind of go on the fermata and you just hold and hold and hold and hold until they cut you off, right? Well, guess what? In this piece, in, in any solo where there is a fermata, you get to be the boss. I play in a lot of chamber groups um, and in my woodwind quintet, Keon, uh, we kind of decide who gets to be the boss. It's usually somebody towards the front. So our clarinet player or our flute player. Um, and so what will happen is when they get to that note, then they will kind of do a little circle cut off. And when the circle ends is when everybody cuts off. So kind of like your band director. Uh, so keep that in mind in the future when you play some chamber music. Uh, so the immediate um, thing beyond just worrying about the 16th notes that I think that you should pay attention to in this etude would be the dotted rhythms, okay? So we looked at the 16th first, right? So in, um, we're in 4-4, common time. So there are four 16th notes per beat. Da 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 di da 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 di da 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 di da da da. So when you look at the dotted rhythms, I like to break those into four sixteenth notes as well, and I like to think of the dotted eighth note as three sixteenth notes, and then your fourth sixteenth. So these are kind of attached, right? So it's almost like there's a tie over those three sixteenth notes. Da da. And that's how I like to kind of count that. Um, sometimes if there's a tricky piece of music, I will write four different sixteenth notes above that dotted rhythm and I will tie the first three just so my brain can see it a little bit differently. Uh, Piu animato in the end of measure eight and the start of measure nine, what does PU mean? 
that actually means more. And animato, what, what um, does the beginning of that word kind of look like? Not animal, it's actually animation, which also kind of can translate to a little bit more animated or um, maybe even a little quicker, uh, a little more emotion, um, something extra is kind of going on there, which the composer also adds in with the crescendo. Um, so think about that. You, you can get a little more excited at that spot. Uh, another thing that I would like to point out is, um, I noticed personally that this was tricky to kind of figure out where to breathe, right? Um, if you play it a little faster, it might be a little easier to breathe, but the fingers go quite quickly. So I would, um, I like to kind of call it a breathing map. So if you noticed, there were times where um, I broke the, the phrase, if you will, which I'm sure your band director um, has told you many times not to do, um, but sometimes especially in a piece where it is only us playing, uh, there really aren't any other options. So I think one of the spots that happened was um, in measure 15, because you're kind of having this continuous um, forward motion with the crescendi um, that just keep happening and the dotted rhythm and it's growing and it's growing and you're blowing and you're blowing and you just need to um, either let a little bit out. I think that's my, might be what I did. So sometimes I'll just open my mouth and let a tiny bit of air out. Um, otherwise I could breathe a tiny bit there And with the oboe, we have this teeny tiny little reed at the top. It has not very much space for us to get air in there, right? So when you are taking a nice big breath with your diaphragm, which means filling your belly all the way up, we don't breathe with our chest, we breathe with our bellies. Um, what happens if you don't have a lot of um, room to get rid of that air? it stays inside you and it kind of becomes stagnant. And we know that we breathe in oxygen, but what do we breathe out? Carbon dioxide. So essentially that air is getting kind of toxic inside of our bodies. And so we have to release it before we can bring in fresh new air. A lot of times in my music, um, I will write a breath mark. I write a little V or a carrot um, for a breath mark, it's just easier than drawing a whole um, comma. So above my V, I will write an I if I am taking a breath in, or an O if I'm taking a breath out. And sometimes if it's a little bit longer rest, I will write that little V with O first and then I, which means breathe out and then breathe back in. Um, so there are a few kind of tiny little resting spots, um, eighth note rests here and there. So I would probably breathe out at one and breathe in at the next one and um, kind of stagger your back and forth breathing based on those rests. And then um, if you absolutely positively have to, um, occasionally after that dot, there is an opportunity, not if it's slurred and definitely not if it's really connected to something, uh, like in measure 20, the last beat is connected to, um, the downbeat of 21, which is, I think a reason why they actually gave you a breath mark there. Um, yeah, so the final thing I'd like to look at is in measure, well, actually 22. I just want to make sure you realize that C flat is um, the same fingering as B. So as B natural. Um, and then finally, let's look at measure 23. 
So this, the first note is an eighth note. And when your first beat is not a full beat, that is often called a syncopation um, because it's a half beat and then a full beat happens right after it. So they have actually accentuated the fact that this rhythm is syncopated. So make sure that you really um, support, but kind of pop out that, that high C natural. And a way to do that, I know I talked about breathing just a little bit. I do have some other really fantastic videos that talk about embouchure, support, and breathing, and all of those awesome things that are kind of fundamental for being an oboist. Um, but one of the ways is kind of a diaphragmatic tightening um, or accentuation. So when you tighten that diaphragm, which is that muscle um, kind of below your lungs, above your, all of the intestines and all that good stuff. Um, you can look up diaphragm. You can kind of see what it looks like. And, um, it's kind of like a rubber bandy type thing. You tighten it and it pushes your lungs up, um, pushes the air out and that can help, uh, give you that accent if you tighten right there. Another thing I'm doing is I'm using my tongue on my reed. So it's starting on the reed. Um, I'm actually blowing before I remove my tongue and then I remove my tongue and that's um, the air pressure is kind of built up behind my tongue and that's how it kind of pops that note out. That is what I have to say about this etude. Uh, if you would like to learn more fun oboe things, please subscribe to my page um, and check out my other videos. I have a variety of educational videos. I have some remaking videos. I even have a video on how to circular breathe, which is kind of a fun skill to learn. So thank you so much for watching and good luck on your audition.